Tom and I are going to talk about uh, what has increasingly become the bridge between humanity and computing. Um, but before we do that, I'm going to tell a short story. Um, in 2014, I was working on a book on AI and robotics, and I spoke to Tom and his partner, Adam Chire, separately. And they both told me they had been inspired to build Siri by this Apple video called Knowledge Navigator. And uh, I'd seen Knowledge Navigator. It was created in 1987. It uh, was created because John Scully had pushed Steve Jobs out of Apple Computer in 1985. John Scully didn't really know a lot about computing. And so he got a bunch of people at Apple to put together this vision video. They were called, it was the first of this sort of trend in Silicon Valley, this vision video um, about what would come after the desktop um, uh, user interface, the GUI. And uh, so I thought that was really interesting. And, I, and I, uh, I decided to sort of trace the thread back. And I knew the people who had done the uh, Knowledge Navigator video. And it was about um, this, uh, this conversation between an absent-minded college professor and this avatar with a bow tie on the screen who was his personal assistant. And it was supposed to sort of chart this path to the future. And so one of the people who had been uh, instrumental in making Knowledge Navigator happen was a man by the name of Alan Kay, a computer scientist who had been the in, arguably the inventor of, of the modern personal computer. And I, I went to Alan and I said, well, so where did you get the ideas from the Knowledge Navigator? And he said, well, it's simple. I was just channeling Nicholas Negroponte. I said, well, that's interesting. Nicholas, of course, was the, uh, the creator of the Media Lab. And uh, uh, so I went to Nicholas, because I knew Nicholas. And I said, well, Nicholas, um, where did you get the idea for Knowledge Navigator? And Nicholas uh, uh, responded to me, well, it came from Gordon Pask. I said, who? Gordon Pask. Well, it turns out Gordon Pask was this interesting guy who was an artist, and he wore cape, and he was a cyberneticist, and he was a friend of Marvin Minsky, who was also at the Media Lab. He was British. And you, know, you can trace a, a path from Pask back to Norbert Wiener, who was also at MIT. And so, uh, and, and, and Pask had this notion about where intelligence came from, and in, in his model, it came from the interaction between humans, that intelligence was this emergent quality, which I thought was fascinating. So I traced this thing back, and so, you know, I took two things away from it. One is, a lot of good Silicon Valley ideas actually come from Cambridge. Um, <laughs> and, the, and the other is that, you know, um, so it's sort of fashion in Silicon Valley to say that things get faster and faster, faster, we're accelerating, everything's expo exponential. Well, if you go back to when these demos first started to show up at, at the Media Lab, we're talking about 40 years ago. We're talking about 30 years since the Knowledge Navigator. And so, you know, in Silicon Valley, it's fashionable to say, um, you know, you promised us flying cars, and all, you know, all we have is 140 characters. And so, you know, here we are, 40 years later, you promised us Knowledge Navigator, and what we've got is Siri. So, why don't we have Knowledge Navigator yet? Ah, yeah. Well, the, the dem demo or die is a good slogan, right? <laughs> it's, uh, it's one thing to demo, one thing to create a thing that really works. There's, a, there's um, uh, science fiction predates even Norbert, Norbert Wiener in these predictions that there's going to be an assistant. Uh, it's been a vision and dream of a lot of people for a long time. What, um, what happened in 2008 when we started working on it was there was a convergence of technologies that were then available for the first time in history. So the cloud computing was now starting to happen. Um, iPhone was happening. iPhone was pretty young back then. The App Store was pretty young. And the idea that you could have um, basically you know, a microphone and a supercomputer in your hand connected to a big, giant cloud compute resource had never been, been there before. But those were required pieces of the puzzle. Speech recognition also. Uh, it requires data to do it well. It's, it's driven, it's a data-driven process. There's not the whole stack of assistance, but even that, we were predicting that there would be enough data available after it went mainstream a bit to bootstrap itself into uh, effectively human-level speech recognition, which is what we have today. So you were so starting on Siri before the neural net sort of fad popularity? Exactly, yeah, actually we, we did it before the neural net thing. The neural net thing happened about, you know, three or four years into the Siri. Uh, and, and, it, and, and the speech recognition went up quite a bit after that. But it, it didn't require the neural nets to get decent speech recognition. And that was just speech. Now, now what assistants do is, you know, they understand intent and they act on it. So that's the whole contract is an assistant. You say something, the words are transcribed, that's speech recognition, and then natural language understanding to make sense of it. And then that has to be also mapped to a computer knowing how to act on your intent. 
and all those pieces had to be there. So the difference and between what I say and what I mean, yeah. why hasn't what I mean, natural language understanding, fallen in the same easy way that vision and speech have, have fallen to neural nets? That's an interesting case. Well, you know, neural nets are, today's neural nets, and they're changing every second, but today's neural nets are really good at pattern recognition and classification and prediction. Um, language, uh, if language was just a bag of features, signals thrown into a pile, and you could just pattern recognize them, then we would have solved the problem a long time ago. But human language is compositional. And so getting a sequence of words to be recognized is only as good as those sequence of words occurring in some statistical population that you can then build a model on and predict from. So but language itself is combinatorical and compositional, and therefore you couldn't possibly have like all the books ever written in, in a kind of Borgian world uh, to build a model on. So, um, and stuff that involves combinatorial knowledge and so on involves things like linguistics and context and, in, and understanding human, um, you know, human context, human language context, dialogue context, and so on. All those things are not easy patterns to see in a data set. Is context hard because, I mean, these personal assistants are starting to know a little bit about context, but I'm always stunned that when I say something, it doesn't know what I've just said almost always. I mean, it, yeah. it, it, I mean yeah. but how hard can that be? Well, I mean, it doesn't understand what you mean by the, the context you're in. Yeah, it does, there's very yeah. little sense of the last sentence or last thing we just said. It doesn't, and I just think that that is kind of brute force, but yet not. That's not really brute force, but I don't think that's that far away. That's not a profound, just the dialogue context. It's not uh, terribly uh, hard and it will get solved. Uh, the mainly because now we have an industrial imperative that it will be solved. There will be an assistant with natural language understanding completely and, and a real conversational interface that goes as, long, as many plies as you want to go. That's the vision that all the companies doing assistance are trying for, and they all have the means to do it, to do conversational length. Um, but the more interesting problem is things like this. All, of, all assistants can do, if you say, call mom, they'll nail it every time. You know, for many reasons. One is it's a very common thing for people to do, and then they do it on, and there's data, and you can build a model from that. But if you say, call me shallow, but call me, <laughs> <laughs> it has no idea what you're talking about. And you think about what it takes to interpret that. But that's, that's exactly the kind of thing that makes human language interesting, yeah. right? And, and that is not something you find in, like, by scraping the web. You don't find the knowledge required to figure out nuance and care and, and, and subtlety of why it would call, why is it even what's a flirt what is a tease what does it mean to be sarcastic or ironic all those things are really way beyond what's present in sort of brute force data sets that you can build a model from now all of this stuff is just computing so essentially what's happening is um, we are bottlenecked by the human psychology so what, we don't have good strong theories predictive theories. So human, most of human science has been pretty good, up until the last couple of decades, has been pretty good at making kind of Occam's razors theories of things, that at least we celebrate, we like those because they're easy to deal with. The math is easier, for instance. Einstein went, ah, whatever, math, I don't care how hard it is, I'll do it. But most, most science is, prefers easy math. And it also prefers small, succinct descriptions of what's true, or theories, right? Um, data, uh, neural nets don't care about succinct theories. The neural nets just care about data that covers the phenomenon, that makes all the distinctions apparent, right? And it's a different kind of thing. Well, we don't have the data to, to cover all the subtleties of context and meaning in language, and we don't have um, a succinct theory. Chomsky is great, also a Cambridge guy, but he didn't he nail it either. He tried and he did great work, but that's, you see, that's the thing. So the same thing that we hear about amazing, uh, the, the movie Her. Okay, the movie here is my favorite AI science fiction. Uh, it is so doable. It's just you want to grasp out, come on, I want Samantha now, except for the part about she goes into heaven or whatever. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, you know, prior singularity, most of that movie is like actually doable in our lifetime. And the only bottleneck is the psychology of human emotion that has to be learned, has to be discovered and learned so that we could give it to agents. And so uh, is it going to happen? Uh, that, I mean, th these kind of models that create a relationship between, a, yeah. a, I mean, that's what we're sort of working toward. It's one thing in a commercial sense. It's another thing in this day-to-day -day kind of life we live with mm. these machines increasingly part of our, our lives. And that's the relationship that I wanted to ask you about. First of all, in your time uh, working with Siri, d 
did you take away a model of that relationship? I mean, Siri is a productivity tool. You tell something to Siri, and if she understands it, she goes off and does it. Uh, what kind of a relationship is that, and where is it headed? No, we, no it's more than that. I mean, it was, first of all, the Siri thing isn't just speech recognition with, a, with an API in the back end. It is an assistant designed to be a dialogue conversational interface. It, we haven't achieved all the ambition of the 1987 video, but we're getting there. But what, what is different about it than just, um, well, just everyday uh, um, doing commands is that it was designed, the interface metaphor is an assistant that has conversational understanding. In other words, it's made to talk to you. It's not made to just, uh, that, does not, that does not compute, is, you know. Um, and and, it, and it's, it's a mix, of course, of human and, and, and learned uh, behavior. Human, human designed and learned behavior. And that's, that's really the sort of the sweet spot for this decade's ideas for in this area. What does it say? I mean, so all of the major technology companies, which Roz just kind of took down a peg, um, basically are moving to create these kind of companions uh, to, to be our assistants. Mm -hmm. Why should we trust them? And what does trust between a human and machine mean? Small question. Yeah, that's, small uh, question. That's but it's all of, a sudden all of a sudden real, because yeah. we're spending a huge portion of our time with with these well, creations. Well, let's just take a, let's, the, the AI that we're mostly surrounded with, I mean, most maybe half of us have it in our pocket in the form of Siri or, or the Google Assistant or something. Um, but the AI that's most dominant in the world right now is a lot less than less like her, or the movie her, or Terminator. It's a lot more like an, ar a f an army ant hive, a hive of army ants. You know, army, army ants are kind of, they're social insects, and they live as an entity, but then they eat, and they do destructive things. They're dangerous when they're a hive. A single army ant's no problem, you step on it, it's dead. Um, so what we have now is the equivalent of army ants in AI, which are basically uh, artificial agents designed to infiltrate social networks and other influences, other ways, to program people's behavior, right? That is a relationship with AI well, today. Uh, as the person yeah. who created Siri, what have you seen about uh, you know, humanity? Well, uh, humans uh, look, you give a Rorschach test to somebody, okay? There's something called, I think it's called the H score, which is how many fa human faces and bodies you see in there. If you don't see any, you, you're supposed to be a psychopath. That's the <laughs> conclusion, right? <laughs> I mean, humans are wired to see humans and human-like things. We see facing clouds, we see Shrouds of Turin, we see, every, we see faces everywhere, right? So we can't help it. And I think when you, we're also, of course, we're social and we're lang language animals. So when we see something that looks like a linguistic partner, we pretend we, we see agency. But it's there, you know, so. So, so, so but, but what I worry about a lot is that as these pieces of software that people like you are designing become more powerful, they're going to become more compelling. And we already um, are using these technologies to mediate between almost every aspect of our life. And I have this sort of dark vision of this compartmentalized world where these wonderful creatures like her will whisper in our ears, but we will have, very, we will have less, much less contact with the other human beings. That's the sort of dark, that's not a, a Terminator kind of uh, dark uh, dystopia, but it is a dystopia. Well, the Shelley Turkle has been saying things like yeah. this for a while, yeah. of everything from text another messaging. Another MIT person. Yeah, another <laughs> MIT person. <laughs> Uh, but it, I don't think, the thing is, that our model of Siri, and I think the model of most of the assistants, because they're not, not all AI is, not all chatbots are like Siri. These are meant to be agentive. They're like meant to have a real relationship with, or a real conversation with. Um, they're meant to be augmentations of you. So they're like your assistant, that is, you know, you, they do the things for you. Um, they might be a companion to, to, talk to a little bit, just like Sudoku might be a companion to play with, or there might be other kinds of art external objects that we use as an interesting foil for our conversation. So I don't think that's pathological that someone thinks that this thing, I mean, people have relationships with, with dogs that are um, more intense and intimate and meaningful than a lot of the relationships they have with other people, and that's not necessarily broken. Um, so AI, that, I don't think it's so, I guess I'm saying it's not inherently a problem that they, they would get involved with it. Let's talk about sort of one optimistic next generation. Um, uh, my mother spent uh, about 20 years working in the East Palo Alto School District. Mm. And what she, f what she found is that, you know, language skills are really related to class. Mm. 
And at one point she came to me and she said, you know, by the time the kids come to, she was a special, educa a special educator, by the time the kids come to us in first grade, it's too late. Mm. So as the, as the designer of these kind of systems, could you design the system to, you know, at, basically at no cost that would basically interact with very young children and give them the kind of language skills they no, don't I, get? I, absolutely. There's a ton of things you could do with an, uh, with an intelligent companion to be there when other humans can't be there. We heard about like living and uh, aging in place and so on where you want to have a companion to help you remember to take your pills or whatever. But when you're a child and you're learning things, well, we, if you're wealthy, you might hire a tutor. Well, you can have an artificial tutor. Um, it, you, if you have an illness, like you need you have epilepsy and you need someone to help watch out for you, then you may have an artificial monitor, right? Well, there's no reason why you can't have a similar thing for all kinds of learning. Again, the um, we're at this, we're this kind of renaissance right now where up until now our psychology, our theories of education and so on have been based on relatively slow moving science, right? We're not really learning quickly how to teach ourselves more. But if you have uh, at scale lots of machine tutors working with lots of humans, finding out what works and doesn't work, you can imagine a little bit more of that sort of exponential kind of machinery kicking in and, and accelerating progress in that area. Just like it, you know, we've already seen it happen in front of us. Machine supercomputers connected to cloud and massive data have learned how to program us to stay on sites and watch videos all day against our will. They've nailed it, and we don't have a chance, you know, right? Um, apply that same technology towards teaching the kid how to read at age four instead of age seven. Right. So uh, we're out of time, but uh, mm. just one, you've been at this for a long time. Mm. You've been doing this for three or four decades. You have a good sense of the rate of progress of technology, and you can see these ticks. You know, mm. Siri was a tick. It was a fundamental change. When's the next one? AI is actually clearly uh, a game changer, right? The reason why it, it, it is it's hooked to Moore's Law, so it has all this wonderfulness. You can throw money at the problem, and it just scales. Um, and we used to say throw hardware at the problem, right? Um, and, um, and also the fact is there's, there's, we're living a digitally mediated life. So there's a ton of data all over the place available for us to build our next generation of science and psychology and healthcare on. So we're in that, we're in that cusp of that, cur of that surface now. So if we can figure out how to make sure that we're doing the data collection, the model generation, the application, if we're doing that in an ethical and an intentional way and not just saying, hey, it's open season, make money any way you want, and, you know, and, and, and if you're a sovereign like uh, some countries that don't care about privacy, do whatever you want with people's lives. Yeah. That's not, that's like, but, but it's inevitable it's going to happen now because you can make money doing really good things. You can save lives, you can do mental health care, you can do aging in home, dignity, yeah. uh, a lot of things. And so we're this really interesting junction right now because people like Tom have gotten these big companies all to say the right thing. Mm -hmm. They're all no longer AI companies, they're IA companies, intelligence augmentation, human-centered AI. So now we're gonna have to wait to see if they actually do the right <laughs> thing. Thank you very much. Thank you, thanks very much. Mm. Yeah.